case. Where's Leila? Make way for Willie! If you saw my PAX Australia 2023 video, then you'll know that there was one game that really surprised me with how fun it was to play, on top of being shocked that it wasn't really being advertised showing it off. That of course was The Prince of Persia The Lost Crown. Well, thanks to Ubisoft Australia, I got to check out the latest entry in the franchise, and we've not had a Prince of Persia game released since 2010, which lined up with the movie. And personally, I've not had a proper go at a Prince of Persia game, or played a Prince of Persia game, since The Two Thrones, which, from memory, was pretty good. You sure about that? You sure about that? But anyways, we've got a new entry in the series with The Lost Crown, returning to its origins by being a side-scroller rather than a third-person platforming action puzzle game. But we've now got a new interpretation of a prince, we've got new consoles, and we've had gameplay changes since 2010, and this new entry releases on every platform. But is The Lost Crown worth your time and money? In short... Yes. Developed and published by Ubisoft and having just released on, well, everything, Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is the side-scrolling action puzzle platforming game that you might be looking for. We play as Sargon, who is a member of an elite group of warriors who, after just defending an invading force, now has to save a kidnapped prince and travel to the mysterious Mount Karth, a beautiful castle and mountain lands that doubles as a mysterious and magic-filled prison. What do you mean, like something... Sexual. Gameplay wise, it's yes, similar to Mario, Donkey Kong, Metroid, Castlevania, or my beloved Broforce. But rather than being missions where you move from start to finish, The Lost Crown is a open world side scroller with loads of creative platforming challenges, puzzles, boss fights, collectibles, and equipables to find. Now, combat is relatively straightforward with a button to attack with Sargon's main swords, which yes, you can just smash the attack button and perform combos, but there is a little more to it. We've got the option to do some pretty sweet combos and flourishes by incorporating jumps, dashes and slide abilities. We can also block and parry attacks, where if an enemy is about to hit you with a gold attack, if you time it right, you can deflect and stun the enemy. But if it is a red attack, you simply just have to get out of the way. A few moments later... About an hour or so into the main story, we then unlock ranged attacks with bows and arrows that can also be doubled as a boomerang buzzsaw. Now, the bow and arrow is just a weak ranged attack that will stun some enemies, yes, for a moment, but it works wonders when having to deal with some of the flying enemies. But, as you'd expect for a platforming puzzle game, the bow and arrow and its boomerang buzzsaw are, yes, used for puzzles. No shit. At first it's used for, say, breaking trigger points for platforms, and then the boomerang buzzsaw can actually be used as an activation key as well. Unlike the swords though, which are pretty straightforward with just mashing buttons, it did take me a moment to get used to using the bow and arrow. Now, by holding down the ranged attack button, you'll activate the buzzsaw boomerang, and you can see where it will move and bounce off its walls, and it's pretty useful. To use the bow and arrow though, you simply just need to point in the direction you wish to fire and hit the ranged attack button, and you'll fire an arrow. However, you can only hold 10 arrows at a time when you first unlock the bow and arrow, and a few times I found myself missing my targets and wasting arrows because there's no way to aim the bow before you fire it. Now, Sargon, our main character, has some special abilities like special attack damages and a pushback and a healing barrier, and the ability to dash through the air with this wicked broken glass effect, as well as having the ability to sort of leave a clone of yourself to respawn to back in time. It's, it's a little bit like the Prince of Persia Sands of Time ability, but you leave a clone of yourself a bit like Sub-Zero's Ice Clone, and then you can run forward and then respawn back at that point if you need to, to avoid any damages or attacks. Now, the dash has no cooldown or limited use, the same with the sort of respawning effect, and is generally used for platforming and sometimes a bit of combat, but these special abilities require energy. Now, a little similar to, say, Marvel vs. Capcom, where you have the power bar at the bottom of the screen, but once this bio is charged up, you'll then store the energy and be able to use your special attacks. Now, some of these are great when dealing with bosses or large amounts of general enemies at once. Excuse me, bad guys. I am running out of air. Gotta get pumped. But a Prince of Persia game is only as good as how the game feels, and with pretty simple yet smooth and entertaining combat, what about the platforming and the puzzles? Well, I'm happy to say that my experience with Prince of Persia felt great. 
Now, I grew up playing The Sands of Time and The Two Thrones, and having something familiar or similar like random buzzsaws in a wall or spike pits at the bottom of a tunnel, it feels like the prince never left. It's also worth noting the first hour or so of the game is mainly combat and story, and before you know it, when you arrive at Mount Calf, puzzles are thrown at you straight away. Now, as this is a open world side scroller 2, the game doesn't hold your hand on directions and where to go. Being an open world styled game too, we have side missions to accept, challenge rooms, also a shop that can provide us some upgrades, some new charms for Sargon's necklace, and these sort of trees that will let us sort of work as a bit of a rest stop to respawn our health and sort of change out any equipables. The weapon upgrades are pretty straightforward, like the ability to hold more arrows or deal some more damage, but Sargon's necklace and the ability to add charms or the options to add charms to the necklace gives you things like additional health or perhaps a bird companion that will make noise when you're near any hidden treasure. There is also the option in the map to have a mission marker saying, go here, but the game doesn't give you a giant arrow saying, follow this path and you'll get to where you need to go. You need to constantly keep opening up your map and exploring a little bit and deciding if you're going in the right direction, and that's a pretty good system. The routes are treacherous, so use your maps. Alternatively too, you can turn the mission markers off and have it work a little bit similar to say Ghost Recon Breakpoint, where the game could generally tell you where to go, but it wouldn't flat out give you a marker on the map. Uh, I lost my map. You haven't been issued a map yet. From this, it is easy to find random puzzle rooms that have a treasure chest at the end of the run, or finding a puzzle that can't be completed because you've not unlocked the bow and arrow or the dash ability, forcing you to come back later. Prince of Persia The Lost Crown might have returned back to its side-scroller roots from its third-person gameplay from the early 2000s, but it's definitely not forgotten about its platforming and puzzles. While it's got simple gameplay and an overall feel to it, some of these challenges did have me scratching my head. Something that I also enjoyed too was the simplistic graphics that The Lost Crown has gone with. It does remind me a little bit of those Disney Infinity games and while it is simple, it works great with its simple gameplay mechanics. Thankfully too, one of the issues that I had when playing Shadow of War was the cutscenes and the outfits, where if you change Talion's armor or outfits, they wouldn't change over in the cutscenes, and thankfully, that wasn't an issue here in The Lost Crown. But don't let the game's looks and simple controls fool you too, as I've lost count of the amount of times that I've died facing off against a boss, or misjudging a distance when doing a puzzle. That actually has to be one of the few issues that I had with The Lost Crown. It's simplistic yet entertaining gameplay, its graphics are clear and sharp with not being super detailed, controls are easy to understand, but the game will give you more enemy variants, harder bosses, and new abilities and weapons to use. The game looks and feels like it's readily accessible for gamers, say, over the age of 12, but some of its bosses and puzzles are properly challenging to the point where I can see my nephews losing their shit at playing this game, as some bosses that I faced off against had me lose my shit. It's a bit like, say, Cuphead in a game that can lure you in with its great visuals and simple controls, and then have you easily losing your cool. But for the first new release of the year, well, at least for me and this channel, Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is a fun pick up and play game. It might not be the prince that I and maybe you grew up with, and you might prefer the mid 2000s gameplay style, but this entry is more accessible and it's more challenging in some instances compared to those older games. So if you're looking for a game that will please your eyes, feel great in your hands, and get your heart rate high. Really? Nothing then Prince of Persia The Lost Crown is for you. But whether your first adventure with the Prince was back with the sands of time, or you're looking for a new franchise to sink hours of time into, always remember to play with each other and play with yourself. That sword swinging wasn't just for flair.